In this, our final episode in our series of textiles, we're going to look at a few, few slides today to look at some textile applications and see what they tell us about man and his society and how he has evolved. We have the first one of these slides is, in actual fact, a Bronze Age garment that was discovered in Denmark about the early part of the 20th century. And what it shows us is exactly the kind of animals being bred at that time. This is for the Bronze Age, as I mentioned, about 3,000 years B.C. It is also a period when man becomes much more settled, and we see the kind of animals he was breeding, the kind of construction of these, of these garments. As we know, the, the earliest forms of garments were taken from hides and from furs, and therefore created a rather wraparound object, a wraparound garment, very simply based on the same format that he would have received by cutting the hide off an animal, fleshing it, and wrapping it around his body. The cap that you're seeing now on the screen is a very early example of a woven shape and quite remarkable for this, this period in history. The, the cloak that is being worn on this mannequin is simply a wraparound piece of cloth knitted in a very, uh, actually woven in a very crudely um, constructed fashion. And you can see the, the jacket underneath that or the garment underneath that wrapping left over right and belted around the middle. Quite simple. But of course, when man begins to stabilize himself in one community, he begins to produce more and more, and he, he can't really absorb into his own society what he's producing, and he therefore begins to trade it. He trades it for things he cannot produce. You find those who raise animals and those who are um, agrarian in, in their origins tend to not be able to produce maybe ironware or steel or the raw materials they would require for fighting, so that the excess materials they would use would be bartered from one community to the next. Once he stopped becoming a nomadic tribesman, he would then package up his raw materials or his excess goods and trade them to someone else. And this begins the entire trade route that began through the uh, latter part of the 10th, 12th centuries AD. And we find one very famous trade route was the, the Oriental trade route that came in from the Orient through Venice. And in this uh, next slide, you will see a Chinese trader bartering with a Venetian tradesman the kind of silks that were being produced at that time, and exactly what he was uh, trading with. Here we can see the tradesman inspecting the cloth as it's brought to Venice. What we, uh, again, see from this slide is the, is the shape of the clothing he, the tradesman is wearing himself, and the exotic patterns woven into the silk he is now examining. The gentleman on the left-hand side wearing a rather extraordinary garment, is very much the type of fashions being worn in China during the 18th century. And I expect with their contact with Venice and the Italian city-states at that time, we're taking back to China European influences, as well as bringing back into Europe Chinese influences. And we find throughout history many periods in which Orientalia begins to affect the interior decoration, the fabrics, and the style of, of decor that we particularly admire. This is um, especially evident through the 14th and 15th centuries in Venice, and again later in the 18th century, then into the 19th century. When the fabric was again imported from these manufacturers, it was then made up by various dressmakers, and we find that most of the dressmaking that was done at that time was very simply done in small workshops. It wasn't, as we saw in our factory episode, done in a, in a large um, complex, it was simply a group of ladies sitting together making clothing for specific clients. These, as I mentioned in an earlier episode, were established during the Middle Ages to service the needs of society, and you had small guilds that were producing various uh, um, objects, clothing, um, hats, shoes, gloves, whatever, and selling those to immediately to the clients. It wasn't until the latter part of the 18th century that the idea of mass marketing or mass production came into vogue, and they began to make multiples of anything and selling rather simple garments 
to society. In this next slide, we will see some ladies making clothing. And as you can see, they're sitting around the table, working by hand, constructing entirely the garments. And when you look at these garments in museum collections, you'll find that they are not very well put together. They're simply sewn very basically, simply holding the fabrics in position. Mind you, there were many classes of, of seamstresses, some better than others, some professional, some more crude and provincial. But you can get a general idea from the kind of work that's being done in this slide and compare it to the visit we had to the factory in Windsor, Nova Scotia in our last episode. Of course, dressmaking shops in the 18th century were, as I said, were not being produced for the, the mass market. And when a client went to see what was available on the market for clothing, they simply went to arcades that displayed goods that were being brought back in from various parts of the world and displayed for their use. And they were primarily in the nature of um, collars, caps, fanciful stockings, gloves, rather nice looking accessories in actual fact. And in this next slide we see one of these arcades and the kind of thing was being made available to them. And you had an idea, these are lace collars being hung on racks and this, is, this slide is taken from Didor's Encyclopedia. Petticoat breeches on the top right hand corner of the slide, a pair of gloves hanging below. A gentleman and lady in this environment, I expect looking at the details that were being made available to them in the nature of accessories. And of course the fabrics that have been imported from the Orient, from Germany, from Italy, being displayed at the lower end of the slide. You would then purchase your fabric and take it off to your dressmaker who would make up your garments and with the trimmings, the lace collars, the ribbons, the gloves, a complete ensemble of clothing could be assembled. But certainly very primitive by modern standards. When you consider the episode we had at Goodman Textiles in Halifax and the enormous range of textiles available to us today, this is rather surprising to see that this kind of thing was happening so far back but in a very primitive state. Sometimes textiles, because of their elaborate um, processing, and the expense of producing en enormous patterns and the difficulty of, of weaving elaborate patterns. In the 16th century, due to Spain's um, development of the leather industry, I would expect they were creating leather wall hangings at the time, a development brought to them by the Ottoman Empire and the Arabs who had plundered Europe through the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries, settling in Port Portugal and Spain and producing very fine leather works. And this, of course, the Cordoban leather workers in Spain producing wonderful, magnificent tool leather wall hangings embellished with gold, etc., and developed certain techniques of stamping with heavy stamps onto fabric or onto leather. In this, in this case, they soon became applied to fabrics. In this next slide, we have an Elizabethan dress of the 16th century showing a very simple silk satin fabric. And the markings on this textile are indeed created by leather stamps, very much like the stamps that were used on leather to create wall coverings. They are very much like today's pinking shears, only they're held in the hand and you strike them with a hammer and that cuts through several layers and all the fine slashing and fine figures you find on the front of this costume are indeed done by this processing. It's a very simple device to be sure, but it indeed embellishes very simple fabric to give the illusion that it's been hand woven. Another thing about this particular costume, we mentioned in an earlier episode the extraordinary range of, and skill of dyers at that time. This is a very elaborate lime green, and I dare say faded considerably over the years. <coughs> Excuse me. But nevertheless, showing the brilliance of the dyes and the obvious expertise used in, by the dyers to produce these garments. This, of course, is a very uh, wealthy upper class costume and therefore was saved for that reason. Very seldom we find the earlier garments or the commoner garments that offer us an intimate picture of the working classes and the serving classes. There are many other types of surface treatments, of course. One particularly important one today is quilting, but it goes back very far into our distant past. It, in actual fact, was created in China, or in the Far East at least, and came to Europe primarily through traders, but more important through the development of the saddle, an early form of um, an early device used by the Ara uh, Arab fighting men during the Ottoman Empire wars that ravaged across Europe in the 13th, 14th centuries. The padding that went underneath the saddle to protect the, the horse and the rider from the activity of riding 
This technique of padding uh, layers of fabric together with a stuffer of wool or animal uh, hair inside that developed a way of embellishing that came down to us really quite uh, effectively in the 17th and 18th century. In this slide next to us, a very elaborate version of this in the guise of a, a very handsome dress and a pale robin's egg blue silk dress from the Snowshield Manor collection in England. And you can see how heavily quilted this entire costume is. The short jacket lined with one layer of, of silk on the outside, a layer of fine wool between that and the backing fabric, and very carefully stitched all over to give a very handsome design. It's amazing how quilting has indeed taken over. We find the current trend today towards quilting has to be a very popular pastime. Just looking down the length of the garment. Even the pocket hanging on the outside on the right-hand side of the garment, in your case the left-hand side of the screen, is a very nicely embellished piece of fabric that serves as a pocket before pockets became popular in the wearing of clothing. Other embellishments, of course, are the, the entire trend towards embroidery, creating some form of decoration on, on clothing and on textiles, again brought from the Orient initially and brought through Europe again one, once more through the Ottoman wars during the 13th, 14th centuries, bringing this entire need to embellish textiles into Europe during this period of time. Of course, the suit I have here to show you is a late 18th century sh suit of a man. The garment itself was sent to China in pieces, then embroidered in fine silk, and sent back in sections and reassembled for use by this Englishman at court during the latter part of the 18th century. We tend to find these, these costumes very flamboyant, that man himself is really quite a decorated animal. But when you think back to the 60s, when the Carnaby Street phrase or craze was established, men dressing in the latter, as Latter-day Edwardians or Victorians, it's not surprising that we have, as our ancestors, very heavily embellished ourselves. And what the costume says, once it's embellished to this degree, is who we are, what our place in society is, the kind of wealth we, we contain, and what our function might be. So it was very important to create these elaborate garments for our own, our own well-being. In the 19th century, we have the development of, of the sewing machine, 1851 to be exact, although that was a, a, f um, a highly evolved version of the sewing machine. At that point, fashion takes an extraordinary change and the use of textiles becomes far more important. Now we have means by which we can gather together fabric far faster or stitch it in multiple layers onto costumes in a far more grand manner and therefore are using fabric at a far greater pace. In this slide I'm showing now, this Victorian dress shows a rather elaborate means of assembling a lady's garment that could only be possible after the advent of the sewing machine. And we see the myriad of decor and trimmings that are taking place on this costume. And of course, there's one single machine that begins to revolutionize the entire textile industry. But we mustn't feel that textiles were created simply for or exclusively for clothing. Here in this slide, we're looking at an 18th century room in which textiles are used lavishly throughout. On the back wall is a mirror which re reflects the curtains, curtain fabric, again a very fine silk fabric, hung with, with ex extraordinary yardage. If one considers the amount of yardage involved in that, about 18 to 20, especially when the fabric is woven quite narrow at about 28 inches um, per uh, width in the loom itself. And of course, as we move down the slide, you'll see the fire screen in front of the fire, heavily embroidered moquette or fire screen that was embroidered with wool on and silk onto a, a linen and the same with the matching upholstery on the chairs and of course the hand woven carpet. Extraordinarily important to realize that textiles are used virtually everywhere even today when we think of uh, polishing machines and in industry felt and textiles are used to polish some of our metals and, and precious stones. Another part of the decorative use of textiles in the 18th century was of course tapestries. Tapestries were indeed invented in the Middle Ages simply as a warming device to warm up the interior of, of cold, damp stone buildings. As we, we progress through medieval architecture into more domestic architecture, the wall coverings that had at that time been used simply to keep the moisture and the cold from the, the walls into the room itself are being replaced by decorative panels. In this slide we have uh, an illustration of an 18th century tapestry designed by the Spanish artist Goya, who created the cartoon for the actual recreation of this slide 
known as the Mayas and the Mummers. And you can see in this very interesting uh, painting of Spanish social life, very important for costume historians because it displays very accurately the kind of costumes worn during the 18th century, but more important, the technique of, of creating a wall hanging or a tapestry in very, very fine detail. This may have taken the better part of a year to produce with two or three weavers working side by side for an entire year, spinning the yarn, dyeing it, making the warp, translating the design from the, the, the painter's or the artist's own cartoon onto the warp and then finally the act of weaving it. An extraordinary craft form itself and in the 20th century has come to be revived by a very famous French tapestry designer known as Jean Lurcat in as much as we're no longer looking at such pictorial devices as tapestries but simply using the technique of tapestry in a much more contemporary fashion. The elaborate details we see here are very important as I said for the style of clothing we worn at that time. But of course that is only their the one function. The entire of art of tapestry making seemed to have gone through a slump during the 19th century and with the revival by William Morris of the arts and craft movement during the latter part of the 19th century we begin to re-evaluate wall coverings, tapestries, carpets, textiles, upholsteries in terms of a much more saner style. I expect it was a reaction against the, the extraordinary industrial revolution in which the machine could produce anything but the quality was, being, was becoming vulgarized and therefore losing any sense of proportion. William Morris and the pre-Raphaelites began to re-evaluate the handcrafted textile in terms of their own society and began to redevelop it. This of course gives rise to the new tapestry movement as I mentioned um, really firmly established by Jean Lurcat, the, the French tapestry designer, in the early part of the 20th century and is now being pursued by many artists as ways of exploring texture, textile, scale, especially for architecture these days where we have large buildings of rather grey concrete styles or shapes needing the embellishment or the warmth of textiles. In this slide that I'm going to show you now is a tapestry designed for a church in Switzerland. It's seen on the back wall that vertical strip with the bumps on the back wall. And you can tell from the scale of the chairs and the altar itself, it's a very large piece. But it simply echoes the wonderfully large scale of the architecture, echoing the light coming from the windows on either side of the panel and lighting the, the overall undulations of the tapestry itself. And creates a very handsome, warm piece of textile that simply creates a nice, comfortable feeling within the church itself. Truly very stylized, but still a very lovely effect in itself. There is an entire American school of tapestry designers. They are constantly exploring uses of textiles, uses of fibers, exploring new territories. And the act of exploration, understanding, has given rise to all kinds of wonderful demonstration pieces. In this next uh, slide is a tapestry by Ted Hallman, an American tapestry designer once more exploring fiber in its woven knitted form, in this case creating a sculptural three-dimensional piece, very much reminiscent of the trees that are in, in the background, creating rather a wonderful piece of, of textile. One example, there's also a, a very famous American de textile designer, Sheila Hicks, who after a while became very saturated by making decorative objects or things that, that were easily readable and began to analyze the fibers themselves. And she began to take raw fibers like linen and begin to bind them with silk to create yet another sculptural art form. Here is a close-up view of one of her pieces, an early, an early exploratory section in which the raw flax fibers are being collected together and bound with silk and rayon and nylons to create an overall sculptural effect creating a much more spatially interesting object rather than creating simply a literal designed piece. The slide we have following this will show the tapestry that was evolved from this that is now hanging in, in the Rothschild Bank in Paris and is the full um, almost symphonic variation on that one small exercise. This tapestry is an, is an extremely large piece but certainly gives the illusion of water pouring over rocks 
and the blue silk that's binding the groups of, of linen are indeed an example of this. It's a very handsome piece, and Sheila Hicks, who is still living in Paris, is probably one of the most innovative tapestry designers on the market today. My own interest in textiles really has, as I mentioned a long time ago at the beginning of this series, goes back quite some times. But it came into focus when I was called upon to be commissioned to do the costume restoration or costume recreation for Fortress Lewisburg. And at that point, I began to pursue textiles on a far more intimate level. But while I was looking for an understanding of textiles, I began to read a great deal about 18th century um, modes of living, societies, the, the wars and transports during that whole period, and looked at paintings depicting the life of Fra in France during the 18th century, so that I could bring it back to Lewisburg and began to use that as the basis for my uh, designs for Fortress Lewisburg. I believe this next slide, yes, is by Francois Boucher, and it shows the petite bourgeoisie in France during the 18th century, and shows the, the wonderful compl complex world of textiles being applied in the 18th century. The style of clothing, the use of hair ribbons, the shapes of clothing, aprons, all the details inherent in this painting, one of many that I collected during my sojourn in Paris at the time, and from which I began to extract information for the series of designs that were ultimately used for Fortress Lewisburg. I spent many, many months traveling from the various towns in France that were reportedly the origins of the citizens who came to New France and from coats of arms or town um, letters or documents or prints or engravings or paintings for that matter, I began to assemble a series of, of costume designs that would relate very much to Lewisburg in the 18th century. This uh, slide coming up is one of the fabric samples that I discovered from the Richelieu collection that I mentioned earlier. These are now in the Moropaw collection in the States at Winter Earth in America. And we use these as examples of 18th century French textiles in order to create the myriad forms of textiles that I will be using for the recreation of these costumes. When I did the research and the paintings, I was more concerned about creating the absolute real look of the 18th century and not simply reinventing or doing a theatrical exercise. I wanted to create what might have been in actual fact garments found on the site should one day we discover a trunk that would indeed reveal garments of this type. For this purpose, I had created a loom to my own specifications, and I taught a young lady to weave the textiles. And from the fabrics we wove, we recreated the costumes of the 18th century, very much like the ones we see in paintings by Boucher or Chardin. And we get slides very much, or get costumes very much like the one that is in this next slide. This is directly from a painting by Chardin, and you can see the costume details taken directly from paintings. These stripes of fabrics, again, from the examples you just saw. And trying to recreate the absolute look of the 18th century. And therefore, when people go to see the, the, the fortress itself now that it's complete, you get a real sense of, of, of that world of the 18th century. In this next slide is another variation, a slide simply of two young girls wearing common, ordinary 18th century clothing. This, of course, was taken from a print, an actual fact from a fan mount I discovered in the museum in Paris, the Carnavalet Museum in Paris. And I took it directly from that very rare piece of documentation and applied it to the costume plot at Lewisburg. And you'll find many examples of these on the site and certainly gives the enrichment and the, the true feeling of Fortress Lewisburg. I have some slides here of the, the gowns finished, being worn by the guides. These were created by myself and the staff of three or four in 1971. And you can see the back detail of this and the one following is simply two slides showing these garments that, that were created from the paintings. There we go again. The fabric being hand-woven, the linen brought from Ireland in this case, the Irish company being established in the 18th century by Huguenots who left France during the 18th century. And for that reason, we brought this linen from Ireland to be used at Fortress Lewisburg. So in actual fact, the garments you see at Lewisburg are indeed a recreation, as best as we can do in the 20th century, of 18th century clothing. 
This shows a very fine example, and actually my last garment before I left Lewisburg is in actual fact an officer's uniform made of hand-woven gray fabric, the fabric sent to us by uh, Marcel Baldé in Paris, and we duplicated it exactly on the looms, had it milled and processed to reproduce an 18th century gentleman's suit. The gold lace you see down the front was imported from Paris and, of course, used to create the example you see in front of you. The buttons that are just being revealed on the slide now were hand embroidered by myself in the 18th century manner, then formed around a wooden mold and applied to the costume exactly as done in the 18th century. It was very important during my period of work at Lewisburg that I teach the staff of three or four how to reproduce or reinterpret the 18th century in terms of today's technology. It was very important for the fortress to be a, an educational tool so that when visitors went to, the, to Lewisburg, they could experience as much about early Canada's history and therefore a much clearer picture of what might have actually, ha in actual fact, happened at Lewisburg at the time. So that the details that were being employed were extremely important to maintain. And although it seemed to be a trifle excessive and for that reason, it did cause some problems financially with the fortress. It has now that that has all been gone and said and done, revealed the most remarkable restoration in North America. And I'm very proud to have been a part of that. As an extension of the work I did at Fortress Lewisburg and the entire teaching process I evolved, teaching ladies, gentlemen, whatever, the techniques of the past in terms of textiles, costumes, clothing, reproduction, restoration, theater, I put together the Costume Studies program at Dalhousie University, and it is a program specifically designed to teach young technicians the techniques for theatre and for the fashion ind industry, and to allow them to participate in this fascinating world. Some years ago, we had a fashion show that would explore design in a contemporary uh, sense for these students, and we had a show that would il illustrate some of the things they had done. In this next slide is an example of this, and here we see a kilt, an actual fatty wedding dress, composed of a rather interesting fabric. The fabric for the design was meant to be originally hand-woven by one of the weavers in Nova Scotia, but as we wove the fabric, we discovered it didn't really give us the final look that we wished. So we took some silk ribbons in various widths of two, three, one inch, quarter inch, and we wove it in a woven technique, and then assembled the garment on a table, stitched the, the, the ribbons in position and then quilted the, pleated the fabric into a kilt and ultimately created this very fine wedding dress. So there you have it, a series of fine, very short episodes trying to show you a little more about textiles. It should have been longer, there's so much more to, to talk about, but until the next time, I hope you enjoyed what we had to offer at this time. Thank you very much. Goodbye.